So as you have heard this year, the the themes for the theme for the year and the monthly themes and messages have been created by the Cultural Integrity and Evolution Committee that makes up uh, different people who have volunteered for this task through the Center for Spiritual Living. So isn't that, uh, don't you love that title they gave themselves? The Cultural Integrity and Evolution Committee. So who knows what the theme for the year is? Spirituality in action. Yes. And I love that. I love it for myself, most particularly, because of all the things that I experience in myself and all the things that we hear uh, about the great divide that is happening amongst humanity. And while I understand that, and I have felt that divide within myself, what I know to be true is that when I feel that and recognize it in myself, that that is an opportunity for me to get a bigger idea about where I'm coming from. And that there is nothing that is going to heal that separation within myself other than my own placing spirituality in action. Now, the, the topic for today is oneness. And that really is the best place to begin. And I loved, Andy, what you said last week about the fact that the second step of treatment, the unification, was your favorite. And it, you know, what, when I listened to that in the recording, what that reminded me of was when I began to learn that when I stated in whatever words I, I wanted to, the thing itself is all there is, or infinite power, infinite divine love, uh, freedom, wholeness, light, joy, peace, power, wisdom, abundance, that I believe on the invisible side of life, which is first, that that came first, and out of that I have been created, I believe that. And then when I get to the part of speaking my word and saying, I am the power. Infinite wisdom has been implanted in me as a principle of knowing. Now I can choose from my little self, from my human self, to step into a divide and to move away from that. But what I've come to know that is a big kick in the rear and a motivator is that I suffer when I'm there. And so I like what Dr. Holmes said. We have learned all we need to learn from suffering. But what I want to suggest is that maybe we've learned all we need, we need to learn from su suffering, but maybe we have not quite fully evolved into embodying the truth of who we are. Because if I did, I wouldn't be suffering. Or my suffering would be such a nanosecond because as soon as I began to suffer, I just changed my mind and speak my word and move back into the power of who I am. I changed the title a little bit because the theme for the month 
of February is seek the common good. And isn't this beautiful for February, which is about love? Seek the common good. Love one another. I mean, really, it's that simple. Love one another. Every spiritual tradition, every philosophic ideal speaks to this idea of love one another. And what's so magical about it is that when I move away from that divide and that separation, see, because I've been given freedom to use my power in any way that I choose to. And when I move away from that, I forget who I am. And, and really, I think, I'm not loving them. I'm not going to love him. I'm not going to love her. I'm not going to love that idea. And I'm not even going to say what it is, because you got, I, I just want you to fill in your own blank, whatever and whoever. I'm not going to love that. Well, then the suffering begins. And lo and behold, what I come to realize is that the person that is suffering from a lack of love is actually myself. And when I look at that a little more deeply, what I know is that I don't believe I'm lovable. And when I look at that even more deeply, I go, I don't believe that I am love. I believe a whole lot of other things about myself. So that's where the work is. Because how can I seek the common good if I don't have anything in myself to ground in and to give out there? So I was wondering this morning, which wasn't really a part of my talk, but I was wondering, well, how does this apply to the Super Bowl? <laughs> I was. And I asked Alexa all kinds of questions. <laughs> so can I ask you a few questions? So how many of you are going to watch the Super Bowl today? This side, not so much. <laughs> how many of you are going to really watch the Super Bowl? Ha. Huh. My, less hands. So there's watching it, and then there's watching it, right? So who knows, who knows who's playing? And speak it out. Who knows what number of the Super Bowl this is? 53. Who knows what year the Super Bowl began? <laughs> 52 years ago. Who knows what year? 1967. 1967. Yes, I did the math. I had to find out if that were really, was really, really the truth. So I read a little article by one of our ministers. Um, did you read it, Carolyn? Uh, Reverend Dr. Dennis Merrick Jones. And uh, he, and this is in his book, The Wisdom of Uncertainty. And so he talks about, about athletes and the Super Bowl. And I want to suggest, I want to share a couple of things with you and suggest that maybe you um, see how this fits for you. So he said, talked about the idea that we all have gifts and talents that we bring into this life. They are there are qualities and attributes that every single person has. But then we also know that we're not an exact, exact replication. So we each have unique qualities and attributes and skills and aspirations and talents. Now, honestly, there was, for me, there was a time that I, uh, the only talent that I thought I had was that I could sing. 
and I don't sing anymore. But at that time, I didn't believe in that talent. I didn't believe in that gift. I did it anyway, but I did a lot of suffering around it. And some of you that know me from way back when, you, you actually got to witness it. I'm sure, <laughs> sure it wasn't a pretty picture. So I want to suggest to you that the athletes that are playing in the Super Bowl have gotten over that. That they have a gift and a talent and a skill that they have honed to the nth degree. And the winners will be those that believe in that gift and that talent the most today when they are out on the field. Each and every one of us is playing on the field of life. And I know that I cannot seek the common good for others if I'm not seeking it for myself first. Now that may seem kind of selfish, love yourself, uh, but I think it's a daunting task. What does it mean to love myself? What does it mean to bring myself second breath by breath to the idea that I'm one with everything and, and that everything that I think quietly within my own mind, even if it's screaming, that everything that I think is affecting, is having a ripple effect on everything else, including coming back at me. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get it down to that, that's kind of a motivator. And so really what this is about is moving into educating ourselves, but it's really, as the Dalai Lama says, it's, an, it's educating the heart through training the mind. So the book for the month, which is in the bookstore, I got mine on Kindle. I like it on Kindle. Because um, I can make all these notes and then I can pop up a page and there they all are. It's kind of cool. But you should go buy one in the bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Beyond religion. Ethics for a whole world. Now this is really interesting to me because in the introduction, as I told Carolyn yesterday, just reading the introduction, I had enough for a talk. And in the, inter in the introduction, he lays out his premise. And what he is saying is that today is a different day because of the sense of separation. Because, he says, and this is across the world, this, this isn't just for the Western world or for the United States. He says that we are putting much more focus and emphasis on outer conditions and experiences, including materialism. Well, th that is materialism. If I get all upset about, you know, something on the news or something, you know, some way that you talk to me that I think, you know, that uh, pushes my button or rubs me the, the wrong way, um, that's, that is a form of materialism. Now, every single one of us are going to experience that. There is no one that gets to have a pass on that. You may disagree, but that's what I believe. When I, you know, look at the teaching and the idea that I'm set free. Yeah, I've been imbued with all of these qualities, but then I've been set free to discover them 
Okay, so if you discover them, but you reject them or you say you're not good enough, then what's actually happening is that you're pushing away your good. So the Dalai Lama says, His Holiness, he says that what's happening is that we, that humanity is putting too much emphasis on outer conditions and the world of the material. And that the healing of this can really, really only come from our, I'm going to call it spiritual practice. And what he goes deeply into is meditation. And he talks about as we step into this journey of spiritual practice and embodying more and more of the good that we've already been given, that as we do that practice, that we are able to switch from suffering back to source quicker. So what's the benefit of that? Yeah, peace of mind, more health. When we live in peace of mind, we are going to be healthier. We won't need as many medications. We will, right from the very beginning, more and more go to source to align with the truth of who we are. Now, the other thing that he says that I thought was fascinating is that the secular world is growing. Now we have heard this in our organization, Center for Spiritual Living, that less people are going to church. That less people, more and more people all the time say, I am not religious. religious. More and more people all the time are saying, I don't have a religion, I don't choose to have a religion, and they might even say, I don't believe in God. So what he's saying is that our practice beyond religion comes down to ethics, creating ethics for a whole world. Well, I, I spent a lot of time yesterday looking up morals and ethics and values and virtues, and it, it got to, uh, to where they all overlapped and made me think of more things and that I was curious about, so I had to just let it go and get my talk done. But, um, but what, he's, what he's trying to say is that our practice of educating the heart through the training of our mind is something that everyone can understand. And if you sit and meditate and you call it source, you can have some understanding scientifically of that energy and not be religious at all. So he's saying what we need is to move away from the idea that any one particular religion is going to solve all the problems. He goes, forget it. Practice your own religion. Do your thing. Love one another. Seek the common good. And as Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven. Or you could say, hey, I'm going to seek this universal energy that I'm one with because I know through the study of quantum physics that wherever I put my attention, that creation starts to happen. You could call it law of attraction. You could call it science of mind. So let's not get hung up on what we call it. Let's get to the practice of sitting. Now, in closing, I want to move to the idea that, and, and just say, this is not easy. Because things come up, 
And when we go back to source or divine energy or God or, you know, the quantum realm, whatever you want to call it, the thing is, this energy has a higher vibration. It's not concerned with all these things. It is what is ruling creativity. But our finite mind and our individual beliefs, things that we have come to learn, oh, I had a diagnosis of cancer. Oh my God, I'm going to die. My life is over. I mean, listen, you, you know, whatever it is that's going on for you, this is the end of things as I know it. And I can think of many challenges, things that I'm experiencing right now that are challenges but the opportunity that I have just like those athletes is to persevere is to hone my skill and my talent is to accept that I have and this is my language or our language I have within me these absolute divine principles. I've been created in the image and the likeness of that which created me, that has created the universe, the planets. Dr. Carolyn said this morning that the universe is not divided against itself, but we do. And so when I begin the work of changing my mind, I have to listen, I, you know, I have to face a lot, but what about this, and what about that, and well, I didn't like that, and well, what about what, uh, that policy that's being put in, and what about all the studies, you know, about what is happening with global warming, and what about this, and what about that? I don't throw it out with the, ba the baby with the bathwater. Because from, to some degree or another, it's happened. The question is, how am I, from a place of oneness, and knowing that there's a way, that divine intelligence, that infinite wisdom that created the planet, that if I, as I get aligned with that, that I become a part of the answer surfacing. So lastly, one of our Science of Mind ministers, Dr. Edward Bill Hewn, who is at the Santa Rosa Center, wrote this book called Ordinary Goodness. And I want to I wanna read you a little story that he wrote about himself that you might relate to. I was waiting on the pier for the ferry to return day visitors from Catalina to California. Before me was a little slice of paradise. There were all of these coral-loving fish in the beautiful clear water close enough to the surface to be seen. Can you picture it? The air was crisp and clean and the sky was magically blue. It was like out of National Geographic. Then I spotted a potential offender. A man leaning on the same railing, smoking. In my mind, I imagined how the scene would play out and he obliged. He approached the end of his smoke and as I had predicted, he threw that still smoking, burning cigarette into the ocean. My mind flipped back and forth between intruding on someone else's life and advocating for nature. I was ready to let out the outrage and the indignant response that I was feeling, and I was ready, ready to let it come out in a loud burst voice. 
Hey, you, what do you think you're doing? I was going to say, and I had rehearsed the reprimand in my mind over a couple of seconds. Before it came out of my mouth, I hesitated because I understood that an already problematic situation was possibly going to get even worse when I acted out of integrity with my stated claim that I was a kind-hearted person. <laughs> I felt pressure to come up with something to say that was kind and also addressed the perceived wrongdoing. See, he began to make the shift. I did not want to avoid my responsibility to speak up. And I did not wish to act out of integrity with my newfound value of kindness and inner goodness. I let another microsecond go by to examine my planned response and see if it matched how I wanted people to know me in the world. I asked myself what might be the most beautiful way to address what happened. My preference to disturb no one was butting up against my inclination to take a stand for the environment. I took yet another microsecond to think of the dramatic and powerful in illustration when Jesus met the people at the city gates who were stoning a woman who they said had committed adultery. He said to them, let the one among you, without sin, cast the first stone. I refer to this piece of wisdom frequently to temper my indignation. Not to relieve me of the obligation to speak, but to prompt me to consider situations in which I act the same way as those that I am accusing. In this way, my activism is enhanced because I get to see myself as part of the situation, not apart from it. We are one. This softening of my perspective doesn't weaken my position. Rather, it opens doors to conversations that are closed when using a more accusing approach. But that day, the Jesus story wasn't soothing my ire. I was feeling outraged, and my outrage was guiding me to scold the litter bug harshly. This deep internal process I was in lasted mere seconds. And while I was in it, somebody else next to the man leaned over and with a smile whispered to the butt-flinging tourist, <laughs> Oh! The fish can't eat that. It's harmful to them. Because there was something genuinely kind in his smile, the comment seemed more like a private conspiracy between friends than like a stern reprimand. Had I not been standing so close, I might have missed the private exchange. The smoker sheepishly looked around to see who was watching and who had heard the words. You're right, he said. The kindly rebuker probably received much more than I ever would have if I had let my anger and frustration flare up and cast the first stone. I've been there. I bet you all have been there too. And this is really what we're up against. As we set our intention to create a world that works for everyone. And what I remind myself of and I want to share with you today is that there is a way. There is an answer. And that that answer is already revealing itself. So the question I leave you with is are you seeing the answers? Are you seeing possibilities? 
Are you seeing ways that you can be part of a solution in a loving, kind way? Are you willing to sit in meditation quietly for whatever time it takes for your whole life? Are you willing to do this practice, to know the truth of who you are, and to create the opening within you for you to see it differently. We're all in this together. Happy travels. Let's share about it. Namaste. And so it is.